Hi everybody, um, welcome to Black All Year. It's really lovely to see you all on this, uh, well it's rather chilly November morning or lunchtime where I am. I'm Stefa Duce, I'm the creator of Black All Year and Black All Year was re- created to remind everyone that black issues and challenges, our achievements and experiences happen all year round and not just in Black History Month. If you've missed any of the previous events, they are available on YouTube and as a podcast. And if you're watching or listening to this after the event, please like and subscribe because it makes sure that you won't miss any future material. And it also helps others to find the content. So today's topic is something that I think we've probably all witnessed, even if we weren't aware that we'd witnessed it. It's internalized depression. And I'm really, really pleased that here to talk about it is our guest, Tina Simbo. So Tina is a creative community practitioner. She's a trainer, speaker, facilitator and founder of Adorn CIC, which is a social enterprise that promotes the circular economy and well-being. She has an MA in community and youth work from Durham University and a, a really strong track record of working with the voluntary community and social enterprise for over 20 years, which if you see her, you'll be amazed that she's been around for that long. She's been raised in the West End of Newcastle. For those that don't know Newcastle well, um, the West End of Newcastle is the northeast longest standing ethnically, culturally, religiously and socioeconomically diverse area. Um, She has extensive experience of engaging with and serving marginalised communities. And throughout her career, she's worked with children, with young people, adults, um, including parents and professionals in various settings, via some really well-established local charities like Health Wo- HealthWorks, rather, the former Scotswood Area Strategy, Streetwise Young People's Project, Show Racism, the Red Card, and the Angelou Centre. And Tina's also been interviewed on BBC Radio Newcastle and for ITV Look North about her work in schools around female genital mutilation, and has also spoken at various anti-racism rallies, teachers' conferences, Black History Month and International Women's Day events. And a special interest are anti-blackness, social justice, intersectionality, anti-oppressive practices and black history. So she is extremely well qualified to be our speaker today. I can see you pulling that face. We get that so often on with guests. They're kind of like, is that me? (laughs) But yeah, Tina, welcome to Black All Year. Oh, thank you very much, Steph. Um, Yeah, and it's great to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation and seeing how it goes. Right. Um, in case so, I had prepared, sorry. I was just, what I was just going to say to you. I mean, one of the things that um, that I said at the beginning is about internalized depression and the fact that we've all witnessed it, and anybody who says they haven't just doesn't know what it is. So, kind of, what what is it? What is internalized depression? Okay, so I have prepared um, some slides and some like documents and stuff, but to summarize, really, it's a way that. Um, people accept the negative stereotypes about the group they belong to. Yeah, and I'll be speaking from the perspective of like a black woman. um, And it's basically, it affects the way people think, the way they feel, the way they act and how they choose to present themselves to the world. Um, And so it's things that we might witness in other people, but at the same time, I think it's behaviors that we ourselves would have, um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, demonstrated whether we're conscious of it or not yeah. okay so I suppose yeah. there's that if I think of one that that really springs to mind and this is not about um ethnicity at all but um that thing of the done blonde and you'll have blonde women who go oh damn so I, I, I'm having a blonde moment mm-hmm. it's that kind of thing isn't it it's that actually I accept that that's true because that is a stereotype that's out there that blonde women are stupid mm-hmm. definitely and then um what was interesting is because I've just been doing a lot more reflection about myself, people I know, um, the ways in which I've tried to like maybe resist against it, but at the same time, the ways in which maybe I've kind of conformed with those stereotypes, because sometimes the stereotypes aren't necessarily negative, they could be positive, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it's quite complex and quite nuanced, and I think just because of the era that we're living in um, and the world that we're living in, then there is systems and ideas and policies and practices that in order to be able to survive and thrive, 
we need to find how we can fit in and how we can get by. So some of it is people like different scholars have said it's like it's an instinctive thing or it's a strategy, you know, in terms of like people's social mobility. Um, and I think as I've got older, I've maybe learned to have more grace towards people in terms of how they might choose to navigate all of that, you know, yeah, how they might choose to navigate all that. It's it, There's a difference from people just doing what they need to do to survive mm -hmm. and people being disrespectful and re rejecting people if they don't conform to certain expectations, you know what I mean? Like, so, um, yeah, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, okay. um, if you don't mind, and, and let us know, Steph, if it's becoming too theoretical or too academic, you know, just... Um, no problem. All right, okay, so I'm trying to do this. Um, the first thing it's asking me, it says host only or all participants about sharing. Oh, if you just click on where it says share screen rather than the little arrow. Oh, yes. Thank there you, you very much. <laughs> um, and I think while we're just waiting for that, if anybody has any questions or comments, please pop them in the chat or raise your hand and we can come to you around that. So, Tina, over to you. OK, so the first thing I'm showing is this slide here. Um, and this take is this is taken from a, a um a talk that I did for Black History Month years ago now. And basically it's talking about um the perceptions of black people prior to the um the kind of like the pinnacle of transatlantic slavery, which is like hereditary chattel slavery. So this guy had been traveling, and this is like in the 17th century, and he's saying from what you've seen, he's going, just think that this race of black men today are slaves. The object of our scorn is the very race to which we are art, sciences, sciences, and even the use of speech. Just imagine finally that in the midst of people who call themselves the greatest friends of liberty and humanity, that one has approved the most barbarous slavery, barbarous slavery, and question whether black men have the same kind of intelligence as whites. Do you know what I mean? So to me, this speaks on the fact that a lot of the ideologies that have came um, from transatlantic slavery were intentional to justify the crimes against humanity that were being committed but it's kind of created this this narrative do you know what i mean this branding of blackness that was still living um the legacy of today and and i think that's a really really good point and i i did a, a black history Month talk with some young people not long ago and it was actually there was there was there was this perception of black people and then it suddenly changed and it was around the 16 1700s that it suddenly changed mm -hmm. and it's it, it's there's no coincidence that it was as the slave trade started to come come into fruition and as you say it was an intentional thing because if you were going to buy and sell people and treat them appallingly you had to make out that they were less than human exactly exactly and this um this slide just talks about basically how important um, slavery was to the industrial revolution and the consolidation of power within certain countries, do you know what I mean, certain parts of the world. Um, and as you'll see, I've got references for where I've got this information from. And to yeah. me, that also speaks to the ways in which, you know, I'm conscious of, you know, like oppression and anti-blackness and how I've internalized feeling I need to back up everything I say. Do you know what I mean? And even the fact that I went down a very intellectual route, it will be to kind of counter the narrative that black people are stupid. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, okay. And then as you were saying before as well, like the 16th century, like this concept of what it means to be white is something that was socially constructed um, to give people access to rights and privileges that other people wouldn't be entitled to. Um, there was, so a, net, there was a need, wasn't there, too? Because I think... Mm -hmm. Prior to that, you would, if you look at um, things like Shakespeare, they would refer to the Moors as a people, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. black. And they were, they would, they would reference the colour of their skin being darker and things, but they referred to them as the Moors because that was mm -hmm. the, the the people that they were. Um, but there was this then need to go, oh, well, we need to say that we're white so that we mm -hmm. can say that you're, we're saying black now, that wasn't the term that was used, but, you know, that you're black you're different you're other um and mm -hmm. did that making that differentiation 
Exactly, exactly. Okay, and then this is a quote that I found, but it hasn't been verified. And the reason I've put it up is basically, if anybody knows about the Haitian Revolution, that was the establishment of the first Black Republic in the Western Hemisphere. And basically, at the time, enslaved um, African men, women, and children managed to feed some of the great superpowers, like the French and the Spanish, you know. So I couldn't find very this being verified it's on a website but it's one of those things but it's this idea that that lends to the branding of what blackness meant it was like okay we can't allow this group of people to be seen as anything other than commodities do you know what i mean because yeah. it will upset the status quo right okay so internalized racism so like i said before acceptance of negative messages and it relates to people's abilities and their worth you know um, and this quote just looks about the different levels of racism that it can be internalized and um, it can relate to people's interpersonal experiences as individuals or groups and you know that's about intentional or unten unintentional prejudice discrimination but then it's also institutionalized so it's about access to resources and it's also about like how inequalities are embedded within social systems and um, so all so I'm saying all this just to kind of create a context and not understand of like what oppression is because we can make assumptions that we've all got a similar understanding but it just depends you know what I mean on what work we've done um and really all of this is talking about a different concept called appropriated racial oppression which is trying to say that basically people might start to believe that it's deserved yeah it's the natural yeah. order so um, you know, black people being at the bottom of the, the kind of racial hierarchy is natural and it's inevitable and I under underlined inevitable because it made me question the ways that I've internalized it myself. Do you know what I mean? Like in things that I saw, like things that I might say, like when certain people have a negative experience and like, I don't know, on reality TV and I'm like, well, it's to be expected. Why did they go on that show? Do you know what I mean? But really, if I'm looking at it, that's me internalizing it because why is it to be expected um and this really lends here to when it's saying about this definition suggests that racial messages are taken in through repeated exposure you know um and when you're thinking about whether that's in the media whether that's in the education system do you know what i mean whether that's in the workplace it's like if you're getting these messages day in day out whether you're consciously aware of it or not you are going to be taking it in do you know what i mean yeah. And then it informs how you then decide you're going to show in the world, you know. You know what? Um, this, is, this is a really um, again, it's a, it's a, it's a flippant example of this. But I remember years ago being in Ghana, and I was over in Ghana working there for a while in a hospital, and in the hospital waiting room they had a TV set, and the TV would show the tweenies and the Teddy Tubbies. That was mm -hmm. some of the programming that they had in Ghana at the time. And I can remember talking to the doctor. So this is an educated man. He trained in the UK and he was sitting one day and it was on and he went, you know, Steph, he said, white children are so clever. They are so clever. We would never be able to get black children to be able to do that. Wow. Excuse me, and he believed that because the figures looked small on TV, that in the costumes it must be white children, wow. and that it, it, it didn't even register that they could be adults doing it. But he believed that that was an example of how white was better than black. And this is a exactly. black African doctor, so that that thing of oh yes, it's it's completely internalized and. We just know, we know we're going to be in a worse position because the whites are better than us is so prevalent and not mm. just in a Western society. Definitely, definitely. And when you're speaking about that as well, it makes us think about in terms of the, the legacy of colonialism and and even though you might have studied in the UK and, and maybe that's why you learned to be his medicine and became a doctor or whatever, it's a fact that the education system will probably be a, a legacy of the colonial education system and, and how white people are being presented, you know what I mean? Or what people are learning like on the continent about African history and black history. Um, yeah, 
and what it's got at the bottom here all, all of the media and things like that that, that people are consuming still mm. has those messages in where it shows white people excelling and and black people not so that you know people pick up on those messages in exactly the same way as 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 we do in the west exactly and it's interesting because it's like you know i was thinking about how then some people will reject other black people because they feel that they're either they're not doing enough to challenge the status quo do you know what i mean like so it's almost like um blaming someone who's experiencing poverty for living in poverty do you know what i mean and not thinking about any of the kind of like systemic issues you know that might have had that impact you know um and how it's almost like a way that people try and make sense of the world. Do you know what I mean? So that it's so people must must the the must be stupid or the must be lazy or they must be criminal. Do you know what I mean? Not that there's kind of like disproportionate stop and searches, not that there's discrimination in the criminal justice system. It's like, okay, people must, it's like this stereotype exists because people must be living life this way. You know, um, and it's really interesting, it says at the bottom here that several studies have documented that there's an inverse association between racial discrimination and favorable mental health. So really what it's saying is it affects people's mental health. Do you know what I mean? Um, and there's evidence to show that if it's people will experience mood disorders or even there's physiological as well as psychological impacts of racism you know like it's like toxic stress which relates to how much cortisol is falling for you veins and how that affects like your immune system so all of that evidence is there um but this like i'm saying it even lends to the ways that i'm trying to fight against that oppression do you know what i mean by saying i need to know all of this stuff you know i need to know all of this stuff you know because at school my, the, the way i was raised i couldn't be having physical fights all the time you know get into trouble and plus at the time i grew up in the 80s you know i was the only after my elder siblings had moved away from the primary school and the second school i was the only black child in those schools so and that was a time when people would use racial slurs very kind of like flippantly just to describe people they might not even be trying to insult somebody but that was just the language and you'll know the words that i'm talking about begin to <laughs> see and all the rest of it so it's kind of like so on one level, I'm trying to say, no, black people aren't stupid. But two, I'm also thinking, how can I fight against this? I need to, I need to understand it. I need to be able to explain it. I need to, do you know what I mean? But that is like still having a huge influence on how I choose to live my life. Rather than just existing, rather than just being, rather than just following my own passions, I'm centering this experience of racism within who I am. Do you know what I mean? And that, and and that say, mental load that comes with mm -hmm. that that you're having to constantly think if I'm going to say this I mm. absolutely need to have that evidence that backs that up whereas actually mm -hmm. if it was something that was not related to race at all you could just say it and people yeah. wouldn't challenge yeah. it yeah yeah exactly okay and this is really interesting I found this basically um and it's talking about racial self-identity and it's talking about what you were speaking about that black doctor in um ghana says three months do you know what i mean like there's no statistical um difference in how much time newborn babies spend examining faces of any race including their own so they're not they're not they're not they're not aware of this yeah um getting to um sorry that's from birth three months they're starting to notice a difference but do you know what I mean? They're not really, they're not assigning any value to it at all. Um, you know, and basically, but it's when it starts getting to 20, um, 30 months, it says here, at 30 months of age, the majority of all children studied um, basically chose same race playmates, yeah? That's at 30 months of age. But by 36 months, the majority of black and white children chose white playmates, showing a bias towards a socially privileged group. So at 36 months, children are already realizing that this group is in power and this is the group I should associate myself with. Do you know what I mean? And then when you get into five years of age, basically children are expecting um, white children to have better possessions. So the material aspect, whether it's a house, a car, 
bedrooms, do you know what I mean? Um, and then we're starting to predict that black children will have lower status occupations when they grow in adults. So when when people say like, it, you know, children don't think that way, they don't see color. Yes, they do. Do you know what I mean? And there's evidence to show that they do. And, and, and that's what, age, age five and six. I mean, that is to think that you've got children who are at the age of six saying, actually, I'm going to have a, a less good outcome in my life because I'm black is actually quite yeah. heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those things, like, then what does that child do? Like, how do they respond to that? Do you know what I mean? Like, do they then try and work harder to make sure that doesn't happen? Or do they feel like there's no point in trying because that is going to happen? Do you know Pretty what I mean? Good. So, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, so it's kind of like, in whatever way it's becoming internalized but then how do people respond to that do you know what I mean um and then what I thought was interesting I'm just going to move this is that it says that by 11 to 12 black children from low socioeconomic status backgrounds were less likely to aspire to prestigious occupations than children from higher socioeconomic backgrounds so if you look at the correlation between um race and class and just the idea that you know part of what racism tries to do is keep black people in the subordinate class then it's kind of be it's going to be an over representation of children who are thinking actually I'm not going to get to live this life you know and that's really that's really saddening it's how how do you then how do you then challenge that how do you then address it um and it's interesting like you were talking about people's personal experiences I remember like ways I felt as a child growing up so I was fortunate that my mom you know, she bought me a black doll from the 80s. So I had a black doll to play with. And she, they set up a community group, you know. So in this community group, we'd go and learn traditional songs. You'd be around other African children. So even though, you know, you might go for months and months not seeing another black person that was within, like, outside of your own family, there was a space you could go to where you'd be around other children who shared aspects of your identity. Um, and so that was a positive thing. And even the exposure to like literature. So I was, maybe I was too young, but I was reading books by um, Toni Morrison and Alice Walker. So the, these were women telling stories about black people. So black people representing themselves rather than how they're being represented in the media. So that had a, a big impact on us. And also my parents' family, like, and their friends, they were professionals, you know? So I knew like, okay, I've got, you know, uncles that are doctors and an accountant. So they've got this kind of occupation, you know. So what I'm experiencing my lived, like, yeah, yeah, my lived experience is different from what I'm being exposed to in the media. So I know yeah. there's something, there's something like not correlating. And I think um, that 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 last point there that, that about the, the difference between the achievement in, from of black children from low socioeconomic backgrounds compared to higher is is really really important because mm-hmm. I know that quite often I have leveled at me well look at you you've done all right and they'll point to people that that I know that have been on on this um on black all year actually and say well look at them they're they're a, they're a surgeon you know they're okay so obvious and they try to use that as the way of refuting everything that's being said because look at mm-hmm. these people look at um quasi quarteng look at you know and they'll they'll pick these these really high achievers but on the whole when you look at us we've come from um higher socioeconomic backgrounds to start off with or mm-hmm. we've had parents who actually whilst they may have been quite poor in this country they've mm-hmm. come from wealthy families back home so they've come from the middle class the upper middle class in their country of origin and yes they may have come here and had to work as cleaners but they've already they're bringing that psyche with them Um, and that uh, so that point I think when people talk about those those few black people who are really excelling they're they're missing that really subtle difference there that we have an extra layer of something that perhaps is the thing that gets us through some of those negative stereotypes and and taking exactly. it forward ourselves yeah exactly because to be honest like when I went to university I wasn't really ready to go I wasn't really mature enough to go at the time and then I, and I partly wanted to go to get out of Newcastle and to be around more black people to be around what I thought was like my peer group 
Um, and because my mom at the time was working at Newcastle College, she was aware that tuition fees were going to be introduced. And because my dad came from that background, he didn't practice medicine in this country, but he had studied medicine, he had studied Nusha. It's like, I knew I couldn't go home without a degree. That alone was enough to get me through. Even if I was wasting my time, even if I was hanging about with my friends, I knew I couldn't go home without it. So it's that extra um, motivation or just that expectation of what you can achieve, which can push you. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So then, so this is kind of like, kind of painting the picture of how embedded it is, you know? And then at some point, I'm pretty sure if I got the next slide, it talks about identity formation and basically, um, so when I used to, I used to work at the Angelou Center and I used to deliver some training to foster carers who were working with black and minoritized children. So those are the children that had in their care. So it was talking about the importance of positive racial identity formation. Um, and then, it, so I looked into what, how people formed that identity. You know, saying like, if you're part of the, the dominant group, um, you know, this is what involves the child observes who's in power, the observe that those in power are similar to themselves and basically they assume that they will achieve similar accomplishments and gain similar levels of power as the members of that group. So it's just an assumption. They take a look at the world around them, they kind of see where they fit in and think, okay, I, I can have what these people in positions of power have, you know? And it's interesting because that relates to how some of the backlash when people don't achieve that and the resentment that can cause because they've been raised to think, well, that that's the norm and they're entitled to it. Do you know what I mean? Um, well, yeah, and, and I then, suppose that's why you get people talking about, oh, it's a meritocracy and I've achieved mm -hmm. this because uh, because I'm really good. They don't they don't see. Well, actually, no, there may be other things at play here that that mean that it's helped you to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And it's like I was just reflecting today about like, so as an able bodied person, the fact that public tra like I don't drive at the minute, public transport is designed for majority able bodied people. That's a privilege because I didn't have to do anything for that to exist. It's just that the way that I was yeah. born, do you know what I mean? It's like my, my body functions in the way that people assume the majority of people's bodies function. So everything's already designed for me. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's what's related to certain things when it comes to other um, characteristics that have more power. So it says for minoritized or the press group that basically they observe who is in power that observe and um, that group members who are similar to themselves might not be in positions of power or they're not, um, that the experience, the observe and experience prejudice, discrimination and stereotypes about their group. And then they assume that basically that members of the minority group that have the same limited rights can only achieve similar accomplishments and that maybe they're not as good because if they're not understanding about, um, you know, like systemic issues or historical things that have kind of informed it, like today, today's experiences, then they're going to think that's the only rational explanation. You know, they're just not as good. Um, yeah. And so then you I know, started. You know what I've got going through my sorry, Tina. What I've got going through my head is you know that um, that sketch. I can't remember what it. It's a really old sketch, and it's got Ronnie Corbett, Ronnie Barker, and John Cleese in it, and it's got upper mm -hmm. class, middle class, working class. And the working class person keeps saying, I know my place. Mm. That's, that's what that sounds like to me. It's the, I'm not going to expect anymore because I know my place. I know what I'm going to get and what I deserve. Exactly. And that's the thing as well, like how the members of a, like a minoritized group, so whether that's because of class or even like, even though with, when it comes to gender, then as might be similar or there might be more women in terms of power than we're minoritized, you know, in positions of power. And it's kind of like how we then police each other. Do you know what I mean? When somebody is seen to be getting above their station, you know, and kind of like, hold on, who does, who does she think she is? Or even that thing, I remember at school people saying, she loves herself. Like, and when you think about, if you think about how we love people we care about, like, why shouldn't somebody love themselves? The fact that that is seen to be a negative thing, she loves herself. Okay, so she's supposed to hate herself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And you see so, that so often nowadays. I'm just thinking about the media, particularly black women. You see so much in the media and on social media where people comment about black women who mm -hmm. are assertive in control and don't take any rubbish from people and they say that you know oh they're uppity 
and they're full of themselves and, mm-hmm. and it's all and it's that kind of it says to everybody else all all the rest of the black women don't be like them because they're a nasty bad person yeah exactly 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 and it's and i think a lot of the times it's like because if somebody isn't living up to the stereotypes that they've accepted as being the norm for that person then it creates this cognitive dissonance, this feeling of unease. Do you know what I mean? There's something wrong. And rather than people doing what they call this shadow work and then examining what thoughts and beliefs that they might have that is contributing to that feeling, like why they're feeling threatened or why they're feeling offended, it's like, it's almost like then they want to punch that person for making them feel that way. Do you know what I mean? Like, okay, then. Yeah. Or even, even if people assume that they should have more confidence or they should have more success or they should have they should and they don't when they're making comparisons it's like that's because there's something bad about this person and in my head I'm thinking well who told you to compare yourself in the first place I know it's society but it's kind of like it's still it's kind of unfair because then what happens is especially I notice how women might do that they might want to then chip away at that woman's self-esteem you know, because they don't feel she deserves it because she is a woman or because she is a black woman or because she's a working class woman. And that's, that's, I think that's why I'm really interested in how we internalize it because we need to be able to like reflect, not so much think if we've internalized it, but think how we've internalized it and in which ways do we reproduce it and then start like working from there. So, so then I was thinking, okay, then, so we're talking about, the title was about revealing and healing. And I'm thinking, okay, so how can we heal, you know? And and because I've worked with young people and this was originally, the research was around like, you know, for carers, I thought, okay, then, so what do we need to do? Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I'm saying, okay, so we need to have access to information and support that's gonna enable us to like, support children to feel better about their racial um, identity, to feel positive about it and that, you know, we need to reflect and affirm people's heritage. That we need to provide emotional and practical support, you know, so people can feel connected to and positive about that heritage. And also that there's consequences if we fail to do this, you know, and that relates to the other stuff about mental health and, do you know what I mean, physical health. And I was like, why? Okay, because it promotes a sense of self-worth and self-esteem and belonging. You know, it prevents people from having self-hatred, denying that racism even exists or blaming people because of um, how racism might have impacted on them. Because that's what, when I was talking before about having some grace, you know, because when I was growing up, like I said, you know, I was often the only black child and I experienced like bullying and But then I remember being about 11 or 12 and having um, family friends come up from London. So they're growing up in South London, very different demographic. And so it went from me having experiences of being rejected because I was black to then having someone who was, you know, black and, um, you know, from recently arrived from Africa saying, calling is a bounty. And I was like, what? Do you know what I mean? And that, oh my God. God, you're <laughs> not black that, enough. <laughs> yeah, not black enough. And the fact that I'm saying this now just shows that, like, how much I've healed from that because that had a big influence. Because then I was thinking, okay, then if I'm not black enough, how do I then present myself as a black person? And it's interesting because that that correlated to me becoming a very good dancer. Yeah, because that was a positive stereotype of black people that black people can dance. And I remember Dirty Dancing, the film had came out and me and my friend, the friend, the white friend who had a whole playroom. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I used to knock about with her and dance. And we used to like listen to um Dirty Dancing soundtrack and dance for hours and hours. And then as I was growing up, I used to always watch music videos and practice the dance moves. But it's just interesting how I went from one side of feeling like basically that you know my blackness was presented to me something negative and I needed to counter that but then how the other black people are judging my blackness as not being black enough or authentic and then how I'm trying to live up to the the positive stereotypes of what black people could be what was shown in the media do you know what I mean um so that was interesting yeah, so going back to that, I like to go on little random tangents, but it's not so random, but it's just my <laughs> lived experience. Um, 
but basically say like equip um racially minoritized young people to cope with racism and discrimination and the challenges of being part of a racially minoritized community and i think this is something that it's like a work in progress because how do you equip people like do you know what i mean is it a social mobility which is often the thing education and getting a good job and having enough kind of like wealth to kind of buffer the the negative aspect or is it around like having positive role models and knowing enough about your history knowing that it was it's like black and inferiority was like a fabrication do you know what i mean um and understanding that you know um, there's something I think that there's a lot about this that it it, it builds your own fe- feelings of self worth, mm-hmm. um, and and it's kind of I always think I, I quite often describe things as it's like putting it in the bank or putting it in the um, topping up your sink because the yeah. racism will pull all of that out. It's like it's going down the the plug hole, um, and you need to have stuff that's constantly topping it up. So all of that positive reinforcement and stuff will um kind of keep filling that sink up whilst the racism is pulling stuff out the bottom um we've got a comment about this and i I was going to say this for people who are listening on the podcast as well uh yes all of the the slides are all shared on the the recording that goes on youtube but i'll also put links to all of the documents and things that you've shared tina in the the podcast description as well so that people can look at that as well Okay, so I'll, I'll sh- um, share it, send this to you afterwards. Okay, um, so yeah, so that was that was an interesting experience because I'm thinking about what did I do? Like, how did I cope at the time? And yes, I became a very good dancer and I love dancing. And then, you know, I used to rap. <laughs> so I became a rapper, you know, and I'm thinking, because I'm thinking, what representations did I have in the media at the time? You had Trevor McDonald, you had Naomi Campbell, do you know what I mean? And then you had like entertainers and dancers and rappers, do you know what I mean? And it was just interesting. But then at the same time, I would what I would say is when I got to about the age of um 14, I was lucky because obviously you've got like in the in the in the Western world, you know, the representation of blackness we tend to see the most as African Americans. Do you know what I mean? And and it, it's their culture that's been kind of exported around the world, the same way American culture has been exported. So I was lucky to grow up at a time where um, it was seen to be the golden age of hip hop. Do you know what I mean? Um, and also films like Mark X came out, you know, um, and I remember yeah, watching that, and I used to go to school, and I used to wear my Mark and X pendant, and then I was doing speeches at school. Do you know what I mean? So I became like a little bit more kind of militant with my presentation of my blackness. Um, and I also remember how, how that kind of lent me to have that sense of pride, maybe more and less like, oh, we need to conform to get by and to be accepted. Actually, no, we need to assert who we are and what our values are rather than feeling like actually we need to reject it to assimilate, you know? Um, so that was quite important. And I realized that was the time up until that point, because I used to love to draw, creativity was another thing that kind of helped us sort of like process whatever um, negative feelings I had. I noticed that I was drawn mostly white people. So just think how embedded that is in your own imagination when you dream, who are you seeing in your dream? When you use the imagination and creating characters, who are you creating? And I think from that point, when I read that autobiography, every time I go to just doodle and draw a face, it's always a black woman. It's mm. always, that's like, and but that had to be a conscious shift. And I remember when I was a youth worker um, and seeing some, some African children who were maybe had recently arrived and noticed that when they were drawn, they were drawn, always drawn white people as well. And if you think how alienated do you need to be from your identity that when you're imagining a like using the imagination you're not imagining yourself yeah. do you know what I mean and, that- and I think it's really interesting so some one of the guests that we've had on Black All Year and Gozi Cole and 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 a phrase she used that stuck with me ever since was that she she was born and brought up in Nigeria she didn't realize she was black until she came to the UK now, of course, mm. she knew she was black. Yeah. Of course, she knew she was black. But it was that actually it wasn't a thing mm-hmm. until she came to the UK. And then actually her blackness became a thing. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it is, it's that that difference in the, the way that people that have been brought up in a predominantly white society view their blackness compared to people that have been brought up in a predominantly black society. 
and exactly. there's, a, there's a there is a difference in um in self-worth I think bearing in mind what we were saying earlier about just the impact of colonialism and how how just deep-rooted that is across all of the former colonies but yeah there's still a very different perception of black identity um and and as you say you you were borrowing an african-american culture to mm. to feel more black um mm-hmm. i i probably i mean i probably did it a bit later than you and mine was mine was african it was mm. Hayden and and, mm. and really kind of taking that on more but that tendency to be to try and conform to not upset and not rock the boat and to take on a lot of those um, negative stereotypes about black people I've seen so many times in black people that I know where mm. they kind of you will hear them say about somebody um oh well that's because they're black and it's a negative thing and I even know somebody who does not use the term black because they have such negative stereotypes with the type of people who call themselves black Mm -hmm. exactly exactly and it just goes to show how complex it is and how nuanced and that's why i was saying before i think it's not a case of whether if people have internalized it it's how and then the ways in which they're they're, kind of like demonstrating that do you know what i mean because it's like you know if you think about the world that we're living in this is just like a particular period of history it's like an epoch you know but like you know um how racism was embedded within capitalism do you know what i mean and it was something, and, and we've all internalized capitalism because that is the that's the way we access opportunities and resources, the things that we need to survive and thrive. So obviously we're gonna internalize it, you know what I mean? Um, and it's just interesting for me, like, yeah, because on one, on I think I might have went the other way in to re- resist conforming. I might have tried definitely I'm not gonna conform, do you know what I mean? But then what I had to do when I was doing some more, like learning more about internalized racism was like just having that grace for other black people in terms of the ways that we choose to survive because we're all dealing with it, whether we're dealing with it in the Western world or on the continent, do you know what I mean? Whether we're dealing with it because um, because we're the descendants of slaves or whether we're descendants of people who were colonized, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like we're all dealing with it and we're all finding different ways to, to sort of survive and thrive in the way that, yeah, in the ways that we can, you know? Um, and it's kind of like one of the reasons it's interesting one of the reasons i even went into youth work is because there wasn't many black african people doing youth work at the time where i was living it was an mm-hmm. older indian man who was a youth worker who actually made me aware about like some of the institutional kind of um, racism young people black and brown people were experiencing in secondary school and i felt like do you know what i mean i had a responsibility so even my life choices in terms of the career i went into was because I feel like I, like when you think about when i mentioned the haitian revolution and what enslaved african men women and children achieved at that time at the height of slavery and i think how much to push things forward for us it's like how are we going to push things forward for the next generation and not just to be able to have positions like individuals i'm going to say like black and brown faces in high places. We know that doesn't make a difference in terms of what the experience for the majority of people are like. So we need to push it further. Do you know what I mean? And I think the the ways we can do that is maybe helping to dismantle some of the mental slavery that people have, you know, and And that's why. Sorry, if I can just, sorry to interrupt, but I think because you've mentioned it, I think it's probably interesting just to speak about some of those black and brown faces in high places. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> because if ever there's been examples of internalized oppression we've seen them over the last couple of years haven't we in our mm-hmm, government mm-hmm, I mean mm-hmm. you know that that whole narrative that has come out of some of the the government ministers about um particularly immigrants but but just and a lot of us I think have really struggled you look at people and you go you're brown and you're mm. talking about people, you know, your parents were immigrants to this country, and yet you're talking about brown skinned immigrants in such an appalling way. That that's that well, it's two things. It's either game playing or mm. it's internalized oppression. That if they genuinely believe that, that has to be they've taken on all of those negative stereotypes about people who look like them and they're playing them out 
louder and stronger than I think most white people would feel confident to do. Yeah, definitely. And I think what was interesting because when I was looking at that article that was talking about like um, appropriated oppression and it was talking about just the fact that it's there's rewards for it. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. And the reward is the status or the reward is access to wealth. Do you know what I mean? Like opportunities, resources. And I think that's what some people will do. Like they would throw other people under the bus in order to like, yeah, to benefit from it themselves. Do you know what I mean? And kind of, yeah. And I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to say. And I'll be honest, the way that I cope now, because like when I was, going through some of the slides before it was talking about how much exposure you get in the media and what I would say is I've started to limit my exposure to media and what I see do you know what I mean just because it's like it's trying to create a safe like mental space for myself um to see myself through the eyes of people who look like me do you know what I mean or who at least don't believe the worst about people like me but then what it can do is kind of like like, you know, when you can be in a bit of an echo chamber, so you don't realise how far you're moving away from what maybe a lot of other people think. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't realise. And I think it's, yeah, I would describe it a bit more of a bubble than an echo chamber. Right, I okay. think that. So I think that was one of the things that happened around Brexit was that mm. that I was kind of, I was in this lovely bubble where people, I was, I was in the voluntary community sector by that point. People were nice and they were open and they were welcoming and it was all about you know, equity and let's fight for social justice and all that type of thing. And because people hadn't shouted at me in the streets for a while, it was like, actually, you know what? The world is moving on. Isn't this great? And then we got Brexit, we got Trump, we got the current government and some of the rhetoric that's coming out of them. And it was just like, where, where's this come from? <laughs> it was a real shock for me mm -hmm. because I thought we'd moved away from that because I had built this very protective bubble around myself yeah. Um, yeah. so it's that you do what you need to do to protect your mental health and I, I I'm a bit like you I don't really engage with the news that much I know what's going on in the world because I do mm. go on social media but mm -hmm. again I'm a bit protective about who I choose to engage with on social media yeah definitely you need to because it's like it's yeah because then the day it's like do you know what I mean it's it's not nice <laughs> and that, you know it, it's a lot worse now but it's kind of like it is traumatic and I think even for me it's like um there's a term about like kind of they call it racial trauma porn and how basically there's all this um information about the suffering that people experience because of racism and it, I used to be part of a, a a group on Facebook like going about I don't know it was probably the height it was was 2011 2012 and it was called Mind Wide Open and we used to have really deep conversations about all the things that people say you shouldn't talk about religion, politics, do you know what I mean? Like kind of all of the like social justice all the time. And I remember there was a guy, um, he happened to be, he was, he was of Greek origin, but he's living in the States. And we're having some discussion about like social justice and racism. And he made a comment and nobody responded. And I was like, when I read it, he said something like, and he was just trying to troll people, but he says, he said something like, I love it when black people complain about being born black. Exactly. Wow. So this to someone who had acted like an ally for a long time. And I think mm -hmm. it's just, he just got annoyed and he wanted to say something, he wanted to trigger people. And mm -hmm. I was surprised that nobody shut it down. Like I waited because, uh, do you know what I mean? I was thinking somebody's going to handle this. And a couple of days back went by and nobody had. So then I dived into this like debate or whatever. And I got so consumed by it. I had just moved into a new flat. Um, I think I was going to make some food and I put something on the stove. And then I got caught into this discussion. Do you know what I mean? And this is what I'm saying about how it can become all consuming. I forgot about the fact that I had something on the stove. I was like, all of my mental and emotional energy had to go into challenging this person and providing all the evidence as to why what you were saying was wrong. And I was so triggered by the fact that he could be getting any kind of enjoyment out of this, like, you know, and then it made us think actually, you know, like having those conversations about the harm that's caused, it's not everybody is there for a genuine purpose. Do you know what I mean? It's because it's like, and it's like, so I want to see like action. And that's why I thought, you know what it is? I'm going to make sure I talk about what can caregivers do and what can educators do and, and what, what could be the ways that we can intervene for young people. So as adults, we need to do our own work, but then we need to also protect younger people from this and help them cope with it. Just because 
I just, I just couldn't believe it. And being in that group was really, it was a good experience because I realized like there's a book called Derailing for Dummies or it's actually a PDF that you can search online and it shows you, it tells you all the stereotypical ways that people who might um, be from a privileged group try and shut down the conversation. So what they'll do is they'll derail you from trying to get hold them accountable for their racism or their sexism or their heteronormativity or whatever. Um, and they'll distract you with all these things like, oh, you're too angry, or you need to educate me, or you're being too intellectual, or all of these different things, you know what I mean? And I think, and I remember, just because it was almost like a debating group, when I was having conversations in real life, people just had to say one or two things, and I knew what was the underlying. So they couldn't necessarily disguise it as much, because I'd seen all the different ways people would kind of disguise the fact that actually the indifference do you know what I mean? And they're aware that they might benefit from this system of oppression, you know, yeah. and, and they're attached to those benefits because it makes their life easier, you know. Um, so, yeah, so going on to recommendations, yeah. I don't know how long we've been talking about, but it was like <laughs> all of us doing our own work, do you know what I mean? Reflecting upon, questioning, and challenging our own thoughts and feelings, you know, when it comes to this, when it comes to like heritage and ethnicity and culture and racism, because we need to understand what we think and why we think it, do you know what I mean? And how we we'll act upon it. Um, and there was a, and so that obviously involves educating yourself, but also educating other people about the history, what's happened in history to get us to this point, but also what have other ethnic groups contributed? Do you know what I mean? Like, because there's been any amount of contributions, that's just like a fact, but but you might not have been told about it. So you need to go out and find that out rather than making the assumption that it just doesn't exist you know, um, and learning about different cultures. Um, and then it was also like develop and share skills. So this is about, I said, useful for surviving and thriving. So I don't know, education is an important one. People developing their resilience. How do you then kind of basically um, regulate your nervous system when you are triggered? Do you know what I mean? Because you're in a stressful situation. Um, emotional intelligence, like all of these things are important to help people survive this. You know, um, and I've put health literacy, financial literacy, community development. It's like, because it's like you've got the micro and the macro, and we're in order to challenge things, individuals can't do that. Do you know what I mean? Even though we like to have this narrative of the hero and we like to put one position person up there, it's like, no, it's a collective effort. Um, and then I've got like basically when it comes to children, regularly speak with them to identify if there's any problems, like. You know, what is that experience at school? So even though my parents did a lot of that work in terms of like normalizing like blackness to me and, and exposing me to my like cultural heritage, maybe they didn't understand the racism I was experiencing at school. Do you know what I mean? Because when they were growing up, like they didn't deal with it when they were growing up, but also it's like you go to school and learn your baby the teacher. But what if the teacher is like there's constant microaggressions? Do you know what I mean? Like, so having those conversations with children. And then I've got like intervene. So if you can, you know, like intervene if you witness a child being mistreated and it's and it's kind of like you've analyzed it to know that what is the reason? There's no other reason other than this, you know, and speaking out about stuff. Um, and then so this was just like roles and responsibilities. So it's just the different tasks in it, like being able to explain why is the community being mistreated, why are they, or why or why are they being mistreated? You know, mm -hmm. acknowledge that prejudice and racism exists. Some people want to act like it's not that. Every, anything other than that, do you know what I mean? And I've seen, I've seen black people themselves do it because it's too painful of a reality. Maybe I used to uh, do it. I used yeah, to do it. yeah. Anything yeah. but. Yeah, exactly. Because then it's like then what? It's like a can of worms. Do you know what I mean? It's a can of worms. Um, and then basically a range of responses. And, and it's hard because what could those responses be? For sometimes the safest thing is maybe to like just get out of a situation, keep your head down and get out. Do you know what I mean? Or it might be to speak out. It's like you don't know. I think people need to see, think about their safety, you know. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where I think with this aspect, we're only going to gain that knowledge by talking to each other and learning what has worked for different people in different situations, because it's not a case of one size fits all, you know. Um, but if you do have more tools in your toolkit, it's more likely that you'll have the right tool for that particular situation, you know. Um, and then role models and positive contact with people in the community, you know. Um, and that's what my parents did with their peers. 
So it's kind of like, just my Arif, my teacher assumed that I was stupid. It's like, okay, then I know my, my uncle lives in the great house. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He lived in a, <laughs> he lived in a then it was called the great house and he had an electric gate and you had to drive. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, and he wasn't my blood uncle, but it was like, you know, when everybody's yeah. like a, a, a curse. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, and then prepare the child. So I don't know about this. How do you prepare a child for discrimination? How do you do that? I think, say- I think there is something about just, it, it goes back to that first bit, isn't it? It's about saying it's there. It does yeah. exist. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, I mean, I've had to do this with my daughter. You are going to encounter this. It's not mm-hmm. a, you might, it's, it's going to happen. And that's an awful conversation to have or mm-hmm. conversations to have of, you know what, she's just started working and I've had to say it again, you're Mm. going into a new environment. Chances are some of the people you encounter in that work environment are going to be racist Mm. and they are going to discriminate against you. Yeah, and I think that's what was important for me. Like when I did get to the point, because I used to do some work in Westgate Community College when it was a school. So I'd been Rutherford School and it was Westgate Community College. And and we did some work with like recently arrived young people. Um, because this was would have been like 2006, 7, 8, 9. And what I tried to do was depersonalize the experience of racism because some of those children were experiencing treatment they never had before. And it's kind of like letting them know it's not about who they are as individual, it's a broader thing and helping them to understand like, you know, what systemic racism might look like, what do you know what I mean in a person might look like. So they didn't start it didn't because what I would say is my experiences didn't affect my self-esteem as part of a like my racial self-esteem as part of a group but my individual self-esteem do you know what I mean I took it personally um, and unlike my siblings I had no memories of growing up in a predominantly black country because I came here when I was 18 months so it was kind of like whereas my siblings had at least went to school in Sierra Leone first and then they went to school here whereas I didn't have that you know so um yeah and then this was interesting teach the child the difference between responsibility to and responsibility for their community so it's kind of like yeah you you can't you have to like make sure you live in your life like put your own oxygen mask on first you have to do that and I think I got to the point where I was trying to be all things to all people um and it, I did get to the point where I burned out do you know what I mean because you know, whether it was challenging people's schools or challenging, um, you know, like, I don't know, different things they were experiencing. Like, we even, like, challenged the state who had anti-deportation campaigns and things like that. And that's a lot to do on top of just living your life, you know. And I just, um, so I think it's it's getting that balance. Um, and basically the last one is, yeah, advocate and challenge on behalf of the children in your care. So I took yeah. this very seriously. I did take it very seriously, but I think when I did choose to kind of put my own oxygen mask off, that was me trying to be a positive role model and understanding that actually I deserve to live a life for myself. Yeah, even if even if I think, yes, we've got a responsibility to make things better for the future generation, it's like we've got a responsibility to ourselves first and foremost. Um, and we're all, yeah, like kind of like we're all just navigating the world as it is whilst we're trying to shift it to the world that we think it should be, you know? Um, yeah. And I think that's it. We are, we're pretty much out of time. And Oh I mean, my I've God, got, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it, it's been, it's been fantastic. And I think, um, yeah, it's really interesting for me, I think, because a, a lot of that was about children, but I think you could apply exactly the same for, um, for children, uh, for adults rather, yeah. in that actually, I think for, we get a lot of white people who listen to the podcast and join these shows and things. And I think it's really important that when you're dealing with somebody or you're interacting with somebody, if you're aware of, of internalized oppression, you can have different conversations and think about what else might be going on other than what you're just seeing. So I think that's, that's really beneficial. Yeah. But I think some of those recommendations and approaches actually it doesn't matter how old that person is. You can mm. you can do that work. You can start that work. So thank yeah. you so much. And the other reason why is, I've got to admit, doing these doing these is quite challenging. You know, a bit like you were running running lots of stuff and lives and all that type of thing. So black all year can be quite a heavy load to carry sometimes. Mm. But I always find that I do these and I get so energized and get so much out of them personally. And you haven't let me down. 
you know okay, oh, that's great thank you thank you for the opportunity i think it is it's such a great um like just a platform for people, but also what the conversations that people have been having. I think it's so important just to create that space. And to be honest, like what you're saying, it does apply to adults because I think a lot of us would have been wounded as children, whether around this, whether we're yeah. conscious of it or not. So it's almost like that child is then you as well. Do you know what I mean? And what That's what it. could you then do to nurture yourself in ways that maybe you weren't as a child grown up? Yeah. Right. So we are going to have to kind of... Uh, draw things to a close um, well, I'm actually going to take a little bit of a break from live events because we've got Christmas and things coming up but we've got loads of recordings on our YouTube channel and we've got our podcast as well which also has some exclusive material you can sign up for our newsletter to find out more about future events and that's https and the colons and thingies um, tinyurl.com b-a-y newsletter um, I'll pop that into the comments. And if you've got any topics that you'd like me to cover in future, then um, please just email me on blackallyeruk at outlook.com. Um, so, yeah, it's been absolutely brilliant. If you have been listening to this on um, on as a podcast or on YouTube, as I said, please like and subscribe. And um, thank you so much. I'll hopefully see some of you in the new year. And thank you again, Tina. Thank you very much. Stephanie. Take care, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye.